Uh, welcome to this worship service. All of you are able to be in the church building, uh, those who are joining in the hall, and those who are joining in uh, via internet. And by His Holy Spirit, may the Lord enable us all to exalt His glorious name in our praise uh, here today. A special welcome to those who are visiting with us uh, today. Well, as we now come to the Lord in worship, let us draw near to Him in prayer. Let us bow our heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father and our gracious God, thank you for this beautiful morning that you grant us to enjoy. Thank you for its autumn beauty. Thank you, Lord, uh, for its brightness and for its warmth. Thank you, Lord, that you order all the seasons according to your sovereign plan. And we thank you that every season has its beauty. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that even now that the leaves are beginning to fall from the trees and will soon be changed into all kinds of different colours. And that is part of the beauty of this autumn season that you appointed for us. And thank you, Lord, for the fact that you've appointed this special day of the week, the Lord's Day, for us to come together to join in worshipping you. Thank you today, Lord, that there are so many of your people in so many different countries and so many different languages, from so many different backgrounds, joining together to exalt the name of Jesus Christ in public worship this very day. Lord, as we come to you, we come to you especially thinking of you as our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the only Redeemer of men. We thank you, Lord, for the rich meaning of that biblical word, to redeem. We thank you for how it speaks to us of how you redeem your people from terrible, terrible slavery in the land of Egypt and brought them into a land flowing with milk and honey. We thank you, Lord, for how that pointed, pointed forward to the much greater redemption that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And we thank you we have been redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or without defect. Thank you, Lord, that this morning all of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ can rejoice that in him we have redemption, the, the forgiveness of our sins through his blood. Lord God, we pray that even this very day, as the gospel is taught and proclaimed, there will be many, many more lost and needy sinners who will hear about Jesus, who will see his beauty and be drawn to him, and who will embrace him in repentance and in saving faith. Gracious God, thank you for everyone you brought into the building here this morning. And we pray that you'll be very close to those who cannot join with us today. We pray that you'll be near them and they will know that you are their loving Heavenly Father and that you care deeply for them. All of these things we pray in the worthy and the glorious name of Jesus and all for his glory. Amen. We're reading two passages in the Word of God today. The first one is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning the reading at verse 1, going down as far as verse 6. And as we read this, please note especially the reference to God as the one who tests our hearts. God is the one who tests our hearts. We know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We have previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel, in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God, we entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up great. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. And then let's turn to the psalm we're going to read this morning, meditating upon a bit later on. It's Psalm number 26. Psalm number 26. And yet again, this is referred to as a psalm of David. David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm of praise. Psalm 26, beginning the reading at verse 1. 
reading the whole of the psalm. That's again here, the word of God. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with bloodthirsty men. In whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. But I lead a blameless life. Redeem me and be merciful to me. <coughs> My feet stand on level ground. In the great assembly, I will praise the Lord. So we draw the reading to a close there at verse 12. And we turn our thoughts now to the psalm, Psalm number 26. Well, in preparing a sermon, I nearly always try to give it a title because that helps me to focus on the main theme. A title which sums up the main message of the psalm, or the passage from God's Word. A title which helps us, I hope, to take away the main lessons that the passage teaches. When we think of the Psalms, when we think of reading the Psalms and proclaiming the Psalms recently, Psalm 23 is a very obvious title, isn't there? The Lord who shepherds. The Lord who shepherds. Psalm 24 could clearly be entitled, The Lord who rules. It sets before us the, the Lord Almighty, strong and mighty in battle. Last week, Psalm 25, well, it could be entitled, The Lord who teaches, or The Lord who guides. On the main themes. When I came to this 26th Psalm and I asked myself how best some of its message, what title would be most fitting to it, I must say I struggled a little. I struggled to get a title that would cover all the main points of the Psalm. And in the end I gave it this heading, The Lord who vindicates, examines and redeems. The Lord who vindicates, examines and redeems. Or more precisely, in the psalm, we have David, and he's pleading with the Lord to vindicate him, to examine him, and to redeem him. To vindicate him, to examine him, and to redeem him. And all three of these petitions, as we, as we shall see, are still most relevant to each one of us in this day and age. These are still prayers that we can bring to the Lord our God. You and I can still ask the Lord to vindicate us, to examine us, and especially to redeem us. So let's have a look at each of these in turn and see what we can learn from them. First of all, in the opening verse, you can see David prays, Vindicate me. Vindicate me. That's how he begins the psalm. And indeed, it sets the scene for all the remaining verses. Perhaps a better known example of a similar prayer is found in Psalm 43, of the psalm we're both familiar with. It begins with these words. Here's how it begins. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Vindicate me, plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Now, maybe we don't use the term vindicate that often. Is that a word that's regularly in your vocabulary, I wonder? Vindicate me? I'm not sure it is. But you probably know what it means. It carries the idea of having the justness or the justice of your case proven and established. Having your case, the justice of your case, established. Being declared innocent of the charges that were made against you. That's what it means to be vindicated, having a public a testimony to your innocence, that you're not guilty of the charges that were made against you. Why did David find it necessary here to pray this prayer? 
to ask the Lord to vindicate him. Well, look down as far as verses 9 and 10. We have a clue there as to why David felt the need to be vindicated. He had enemies, and they were vicious enemies. They were referred to, as you can see, as bloodthirsty men. Isn't that a very vivid description of the antagonism of these men? They're, they're bloodthirsty. You refer to thirsty for water. That's, that's, that's good. That's, that's fine. But thirsty for, for blood? Bloodthirsty men. And thirsty for David's blood. So he has enemies. And clearly they're trying to discredit him as well. Because he tells us, doesn't he, that in verse 10, their hands are full of bribes. So they're bribing people to try and discredit David. They're out to shed his blood. They're out to discredit him by the widespread use of bribery. Full of bribes. Now we don't know the precise nature of the charges being brought against David. But David must have felt greatly threatened here by men who were out to shed his blood, by men who were ready to use bribery against him. He must have felt greatly troubled and greatly, uh, greatly threatened. Well, you probably have never faced such an extreme attack. You probably haven't encountered either. People who are out for your blood, thirsty for your blood. You probably haven't been the victim of bribery. Hopefully not. But have there not been times when you have been falsely accused and felt in need of vindication? Times when people have misrepresented you and have endangered your reputation and your good name. In this fallen world, you will do very well if you get through life without being unjustly accused in some form or other. So I look back over my life I'm not going to go into the details, but I can think of at least three occasions when I, I, I felt deeply hurt because I was being misrepresented and unjustly charged. One of them was when I was at school, uh, one of them was when I was in a particular workplace, and one of them was even in a congregational setting, not in this congregation, I hasten to add. But it's a very, very hurtful thing. It really hurts, doesn't it, uh, when you believe you're being totally misrepresented unjustly charged. You want to be vindicated. Sometimes it hurts a lot. It brings great anguish into our lives and we rightly desire to be vindicated. So how, how should we react when we find, find ourselves in such a circumstance? How can we react? How should we react? How have you reacted when faced with such circumstances? What are the options? What course of action are open to us? Well, we might, of course, speak out strongly in our own defense. And uh, we might deny the very, very strongly the accuracy of the accusations. And that's an appropriate thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that for, for standing up for yourself when, you're, when your cause is just. If you remain silent, indeed, you might, it might even be taken as a sign of guilt that you've something to hide. Indeed, if you examine the letters of Paul, you find he devotes actually quite a bit of space in some of his letters to defending himself against unjust charges because the cause of the gospel was at stake. So he had to defend himself as an apostle in order to defend the gospel. We have an example of that in the passage you read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't we? There we have Paul affirming he had never used flattery, he had never put on a mask very appropriate in this setting. <laughs> he had never put on a mask to cover up greed. Never used flattery. Never been greedy. Evidently, some of his opponents had been accusing him of flattery and of greed. So it was necessary for Paul to write and to defend himself against such false accusations. To vindicate himself in the eyes of the Thessalonian congregation. So yes, yes, we are entitled to to vindicate ourselves, to speak out in our defense. And even, one would say, in extreme cases, it must be an extreme case, where the accusations are coming from unbelievers, in some cases, it may even be necessary as a last resort to avail of the law courts. That's why we have laws of defamation. 
laws against slander and laws against libel. These are necessary laws to protect the reputation of innocent people against such crimes as slander and libel. Such vindication you get in the court of law, of course, carries a lot of weight. But the reality is that despite our best efforts, despite marshalling the very best of evidence in our defence, despite all of that, full vindication may not be easily attained. May not be easily attained. So when you are treated unjustly, I wonder, do, do you bring your case to the Lord as David did? Not just speak up in your own defence, but is one of your first thoughts, I should bring this to the Lord and ask him to see that the, the truth will come out. Do you do that? Do you ask him to vindicate you? Do you trust him enough to do that? It's interesting, isn't it? That after bringing this petition, David accomplished it with a declaration of his unwavering trust in the Lord. Uh, look at what he says at the end of verse 1. Uh, the Hebrew here is a number of different translations, but this is probably a good translation of it, where, where it says, I have trust in the Lord without wavering. Without wavering. Isn't it good he can claim to have such an unwavering trust in the Lord? For as fickle human beings, our trust can waver, can't it? All too easily at times. Must he not admit that sometimes, rather than being like David in this particular situation, where he didn't trust the Lord, rather we may more, more likely resemble Peter on that occasion when he looked at the, at the waves and he saw the waves instead of looking to the Lord and therefore he began to panic. May we aim to maintain an unwavering trust in the Lord of steadfast love and faithfulness. May we always be ready to entrust our cause into his hands. And the perfect example of this, you know who the perfect example of this is, I'm sure? The perfect example of this is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, one who was totally unjustly accused, where he did not done no wrong. Remember what is said of him in 1 Peter 2, verse 23. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So brothers and sisters, David here provides us with a good example of what we should do whenever we are being treated unjustly. Is that what you usually do? Do you bring your cause before the Lord and ask him to vindicate you? Do you trust him enough to keep on doing so, even when there's no immediate resolution of the issue, because these things can go on and on? Rather than becoming embittered, which is all too possible, rather than lashing out in retaliation, which is all too possible for us as human beings, may we have sufficient trust to keep on seeking vindication from the Lord our God. May we not be tempted to think it a waste of time to ask the Lord to vindicate us. For he is a judge of all the earth, and he will do it. Right. David prayed, yeah. vindicate me. And vindicate me is a prayer that you too can pray, and you too should pray, whenever you are unfairly treated. Time to move on now to the second prayer that David prayed. One that, of course, is intimately linked to the first one. For as well as praying, vindicate me, you can see David also prayed, examine me, examine me. Look at verse 2, verse 2. You can see that they expressed the prayer in three different ways, didn't they? Three different ways. Not only did he pray, examine me, you can see he also prayed, test me and try me or prove me. Examine me, test me, try me. I don't think we should try to draw fine distinctions of meaning between these three verbs. The verbs examine, test and try. Some try to do that, but I don't think it's really the right thing to do. These three are used, they're just, they're saying the same thing. They're emphasizing David's readiness to be examined by the Lord. And furthermore, see this, 
he is willing to have the Lord examine him most thoroughly, isn't he? Most thoroughly. You see what he says? Examine my heart and my mind is what he prays. Examine my heart and my mind. Examine me fully. Examine me completely. Examine me in the totality of my being and my personality. Examine me thoroughly. This might make you think, might it, of Psalm 139, the well-known petition at the very end of the psalm, where the psalmist prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a challenging prayer to pray? Search me, O God. And we know, don't we? The Lord is well able to examine us thoroughly. Human judgment is often limited, superficial, and mistaken. So often we get people wrong, we, we misinterpret their motives, we misinterpret their actions, and we judge them unfairly, and we judge them sinfully. Not so the Lord. Not so the Lord. Think again of what Paul wrote in that passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He referred to God, you remember, as the one who tests our hearts, our inward being. He tests our hearts. Nothing at all is hidden from his divine scrutiny. There are no cupboards in which we can man manage to hide away our skeletons from him. You know, we, we use the expression skeletons in the cupboard. Those uh, <coughs> things we're ashamed of that we manage to hide away from everyone else. We can't hide them from the Lord. He'll see into any cupboard that we may try to use. He sees into every nook and cranny of your life. He probes the deepest recesses of your heart. He sees you as you really are. To, to be examined by God can be a very disconcerting thing. If you have secret sins in your life, that you've managed to hide from others. You cannot hide them from his all-seeing eye. So it's no small thing or no light thing to pray the kind of prayer that David prayed here. Lord, examine me. Lord, test me. Lord, try me. Why then was David so willing to ask the Lord to examine him, to thoroughly test his mind and heart? Why? Well, verses 3 to 11 give us the reasons why David was right to pray this prayer. They can be summed up by saying that David knew himself to be a man of integrity. A man of integrity. Some versions actually use the word integrity. The NIV prefers the term blameless. Note the use of the term blameless in verse 1, where he says, I have led a blameless life. And it's found again in verse 11. But I lead a blameless life. Of course, David is not claiming a sinless life. Who could claim that? And we know that David is far from sinless. But he is asserting, particularly in relation to this particular charge, and in his life in general, he's been a man of integrity. He's, been in, he's had a genuine commitment to the Lord. He's been a genuine servant of the Lord. No one can justly point the finger of blame at him in this instance. We can identify three aspects of David's blameless life. Three ways in which his integrity showed itself. Here they are. First of all, he had lived with a constant focus on the love and faithfulness of the Lord. A constant focus on the love and faithfulness of the Lord. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 tells us this. For your love is ever before me and I walk continually in your truth. See the word ever there and the word continually? It could be translated, I walk continually in your faithfulness. That word truth to be the same word as faithfulness. So probably better translated, for your love is ever before me and I walk continually in your faithfulness. Here we have an incentive to live a life of godliness and integrity. The Lord whom we are called to serve 
is one who is loving and faithful. The Lord whom we're called to serve, he's not a hard taskmaster. We are assured that he will always remain faithful to us. So you and I, we should focus day by day on the love and faithfulness of the one we're called to serve. This will inspire us. This will inspire us and help us to serve him loyally and faithfully in return. This will help you to trust in your Lord with, without wavering. That's the first thing then. He had a constant focus, a constant continual focus on the love and faithfulness of the Lord. In the second place, verses 4 and 5 tell us David's integrity manifested itself in maintaining a separation from the ungodly. A separation from the ungodly. He does not allow himself to become closely entangled with those whom he calls them, he calls them deceitful men, the hypocrites, the evildoers, and the wicked. Strong language here. He even goes as far as to say that he abhors the assembly of evildoers. He abhors it. Think about that for a moment, that word abhor. To abhor something is to have the strongest revulsion toward it. If you abhor something, you just find it revolting, you have a strong revulsion against it. If you love the Lord, you must have an abhorrence of evil doing and wickedness. It is right for us as the people of God to abhor the wicked practice of abortion, the killing of the unborn. It is right for us as the people of God to abhor the terrible destructive actions of terrorists in our world. It is right for us as the people of God to abhor the drug dealers who ruin the lives of young people and the lives of many others too. It is right for us, the people of God, to abhor the human traffickers who take advantage of the vulnerable, to exploit them and to ruin their lives. Yes, of course, we must always recognize there, but for the grace of God, go we. We should always pray that the wicked be brought to repentance. But we must never lose that attitude of abhorrence toward what is blatantly wicked and evil. We mustn't take it lightly. We mustn't just say, oh, that's the way things are. We should be appalled by it. David abhorred the deeds of evildoers. He made sure that he did not get entangled with them. A life of integrity does involve a definite separation from the plots and plans and actions and the assemblies of the ungodly. We must never lose sight of that. You must abhor the assembly of evildoers, you must refuse to sit with the wicked and join in their plans. In the third place, as well as David's integrity, integrity manifesting itself, focusing on the Lord's faithful love, in separating himself from the assemblies of the ungodly, David's integrity also expressed itself in devoted worship, in devotion to the Lord. Look at verses 6 to 8. The focus here is on the house of the Lord, on the sanctuary in Jerusalem, on the altar where the sacrifices were offered up to the Lord. The place that David thinks so highly of because he knows it to be the place where the Lord's glory dwells. I want you to notice how devoted David was to the worship of God. What has he been doing in the house of the Lord? Verse 7. Proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. David says he's been doing this. He's been coming into the house of the Lord and he's been proclaiming aloud the praises of God. He's been telling of God's wonderful deeds. And even though we do not need to go to an altar anymore, you and I do not need to bring animal sacrifice with us today because the one perfect sacrifice has been offered up once and for all by our beloved Saviour. Even though we do not need to go to an altar, surely we're still called to join in proclaiming aloud the praise of the Lord and to keep on telling of his wonderful deeds, publicly proclaiming his glory in our times of worship. So may each of you be keen 
to keep on joining in each Lord's Day, and whenever you have the opportunity of doing so, in proclaiming the wonderful deeds of the Lord your God. And in verse 8, David expresses his commitment to devoted worship when he declares, I love the house where you live, O Lord. I love the house where you live, O Lord. That's strong language, isn't it? He doesn't just say, well, I, I go along to the house where you live, O Lord. Or I have an interest in the house where, where, where you live, O Lord. No, I love it. This meeting house is not the equivalent of the temple or the sanctuary where David worshipped. It should nevertheless be a place where you and I do love to come. A place where we can publicly express our devotion to the Lord. The Lord who has done such wonderful things for you and for me. Three marks therefore of David's integrity. He had a focus on the Lord's love and faithfulness that inspired him. He kept separate from the assemblies of the ungodly so that he might live a holy life. And he devoted himself to the worship of the Lord. May these three marks be present in our lives so we can sincerely identify ourselves as men, women, and young people of integrity. So we can dare, as David did, dare to ask the Lord, examine me, examine me. Such examination will never reveal a sinless life. Such an examination will give us all reasons to be sorry for our sin, but may it also reveal a life of genuine devotion to the Lord. May you be able to pray this day without undue fear. May you be able to pray, Lord, examine me. That's a, that's a searching prayer. That's a challenging prayer. David could pray. May you and I be able to pray because we are living by the grace of God lives of integrity. David prayed, vindicate me. David prayed, examine me. And David also prayed, redeem me. Redeem me. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. The verb redeem is, as you know, one of the great Bible words, isn't it? It's one you're all familiar with. How joyfully we, we, we refer to the Lord Jesus as our Redeemer, the only Redeemer of men. The only Redeemer of men. We do need, however, to identify the precise meaning of this word in the context of the psalm. For while to redeem speaks ultimately of that glorious redemption from sin through Jesus Christ, the verb is actually used here as it is often used in terms of delivering someone from distress, from danger, or from death. To deliver someone from distress, danger, or death. It has such a meaning here, can be seen from the petition that it's linked with in verse 9. Look at verse 9. Notice how David prays there, Do not take away my soul along with sinners. My life with bloodthirsty men. These bloodthirsty men have been threatening his very life. And therefore the call for redemption in verse 11 is primarily a call to be delivered from that danger. And actually the verb redeem is used in a similar way in many other of the Psalms. At the end of the preceding Psalm where David prayed, Redeem Israel, O Lord, from all their troubles. So David is here praying for the Lord to vindicate him, to examine him, and then to redeem him or deliver him from the danger that he is in. But lest we think that David is being self-righteous here, which is what we might be tempted to think, he clearly indicates his ultimate hope for redemption, his ultimate hope for vindication. Where does it lie? Well, look what he adds in verse 11. It's important. Redeem me and be merciful to me. Yes, he says I've been living a life of integrity, but he still recognizes he needs the Lord to redeem him and to be to be merciful to him. Be merciful to me. That's that's a that's just a vital prayer. 
for any human being to be ready to pray, Lord, be merciful to me. He doesn't just say, redeem me. He adds, be merciful to me. So while the redemption in view here, the context, is primarily deliverance from danger from his enemies, surely it also reminds us today, and points us forward to the much greater redemption provided by our merciful God in and through Jesus Christ to all who believe in him. Such redemption is spoken of in Psalm 130, where the psalmist declares, with the Lord is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So David prayed here, redeem me. That merciful God might redeem him from the danger he was in. How much more wonderful a thing it is for a lost and guilty and undeserving sinner who could never redeem himself, who does not even deserve to be redeemed, who would pray to a merciful God, redeem me from my sins. If you need to ask, let me ask you very directly. Is this a prayer that you have prayed? Even if you haven't used these exact words, have you asked for the mercy of God? Have you admitted yourself to be a guilty sinner? Have you cast yourself on the mercy of God? Have you, have you called upon him, Lord, redeem me? Have you looked to Jesus Christ as the only redeemer of men to redeem you? If you have not yet done so, there is no more crucial prayer that anyone could ever pray. Lord, redeem me and be merciful to me. Lord, redeem me and be merciful to me. That's of the essence of a prayer for salvation. It's simple and it's wonderful that unworthy sinners can pray such a prayer as this to a Lord who is ready to be merciful, a Lord who is rich in mercy. So yes, this psalm can be summed up very well speaks of the Lord who vindicates, the Lord who examines, and the Lord who redeems. But in closing, I've left something out. I probably left a few things out, but I've left one thing out so far anyway. There's one more thing in the psalm that you should not miss. That you should not miss. So far we haven't mentioned the very last verse of the psalm. It will be an oversight that we did not well for the moment on the last verse. Having prayed to the Lord to vindicate him, to examine him and to redeem him, David then confidently declares that his feet stand on level ground. You see what he says there in verse 12? My feet stand on level ground. In the great assembly I will praise the Lord. What does he mean by this? This is an expression we find elsewhere in the Psalms and in the book of Isaiah, other places in the Bible. What's it mean when David says, My feet stand on level ground? But well, surely he means he's not in danger of slipping or falling. He's not on a slippery slope, but he's on ground where the going is smooth and he's free from the danger of falling. Let me think of this. It's not like being on that uneven, slippery surface that you find in the Giant's Causeway. I've not ever walked on the stones of the Giant's Causeway. I have done so and I was, I was very cautious. I was very cautious about it. And I saw that they were slippery, very slippery in some places. At my age, I didn't fancy a ball. Not right for the young, maybe. But I didn't fancy a ball. They were slippery. They weren't even. You could easily trip over them. They weren't level ground. Well, this is not being like on being on uneven or, or slippery ground. David's feet, he says, are on level ground. He has a sense of security, confidence that the Lord is directing him and watching over him. You see, the Lord does not place his people on slippery ground. Rather, he takes us out of the miry pit and he places our feet on a rock on which we can stand. Because David's feet have been placed on this level ground. He's confident that he will be able once again to go to the great assembly and join once again in praising the Lord. See how it ends? 
my feet stand on level ground. I feel safe and secure in the Lord who will vindicate me. He will redeem me. And in the great assembly, I will praise the Lord. What confidence he has. May you have such confidence this day. Despite the challenge of traveling through a world full of unfairness, injustice, and ungodliness, a world that is full of slippery slopes, may you still have the same confidence that David had. You're in the hands of a merciful Redeemer who is able to keep you from falling and who will bring you safely to the great assembly in heaven, the great assembly in heaven, where you will most joyfully join in the singing of your great Redeemer's praise. David could look forward to the prospect in the great assembly, I will praise the Lord. How good it is to have a Lord who vindicates us, who examines us thoroughly, and especially a merciful, a merciful Savior who redeems us. Amen. Praise be to his name. We're going to sing praise now as we may see it. These words in Psalm number 26. Psalm number 26. See how the psalmist prays for the Lord to examine him thoroughly. And yet the Lord's mercy or the Lord's love is before his eyes. Stanza 2. Examine me and prove me, Lord. Try heart and mind, I pray. Your mercy or your love is before my eyes. Your truth or your faithfulness has led my way. Psalm number 26. Let's join together in the singing of praise to the Lord.